Hello and welcome to This Is. Today we're going to look at the best PlayStation devices, or I guess all the PlayStation devices. But first, Austin, let me say, that is a wonderful, wonderful shirt you're wearing. I'm not doing it. I'm not plugging your merch. You made me wear it. You very kindly gave it to me on Mystery Tech. I'm not plugging your merch. Who said anything about plugging merch? I was just complimenting your sense of fashion. Anyway, to start out the tier list, we have the Sony PSP. I loved the PSP. So much. The day that my family got the, their very first HD TV, my PSP broke because we put the seat down to, to get the t uh, TV in the in the car, and my PSP was wedged in the seat and it cracked this the the PSP in half. What? It, like entirely in half? Yeah, it, it got stuck in like in the hinge mechanism. I have a lot of fond memories of the PSP. So up until that point, I had been a Game Boy kid, but the PSP really opened my eyes to the idea that gaming can be more than just sort of very simple sprite-based stuff, right? I mean, a lot of PSP games were really on par with the PlayStation 2 of the day, and that was incredible in a handheld. Yeah, sure, UMDs were a little bit silly, but as far as I'm concerned, oh God, where do we place the PSP? It's gotta be on the... A tier, B tier, A tier. The only reason I wouldn't give it S tier what would be because, well, like, like you say, a lot of them were actually like, you know, full console, like close games. But then there was a good handful of them. I think it was like Mafia one or two or whatever that I got in, which was, you know, I, I was really excited to be playing this game on PSP. It was like, just like a turn-based game. And I got, I was so devastated when I got that, but, that's the only reason I wouldn't give it S tiers, because of games like that. Honestly, there were so many great games on the PSP. It's easy to look back now and say, not only was it on point as far as design goes, but really it was ahead of its time and really moved the mobile gaming industry forward. I mean, a lot of games, even what, 15 years later, are only just now hitting the same kind of production values that a lot of PSP titles had. Totally agree. I'm going A tier. A tier it is. So next up we have the PSP Go, which to be honest, I think this is what the PSP should have been from day one. I don't know how technically feasible that was, but um, as much as I love the PSP, I hated UMD and having it all digital on the on the handheld system to me was such a game changer. It was so ahead of its time. So you look today, right? We see the PlayStation 5 Digital Edition or the Xbox One S All Digital Edition, right? They're just now starting in a lot of cases to move away to even just give you an option to not have to buy physical media and go completely digital. So I was a very early adopter of Minidisc, which was Sony's uh, CD replacement, which was basically UMD, except it came in a square packaging, I don't know, like shell. And then I got super excited when the PSP was announced and I'm like, oh, I have all these mini discs. Can I play it on the PSP? Can I have like an all-in-one media system? And then PSP is like, no, but the reason I'm giving it the low rank is because Sony insisted on still using their proprietary media um, for, for saves, and that was so expensive. So the PSP Go came out in 2009, and at that point, smartphones had really well and truly taken over, and mobile gaming was really starting to become popular. The PSP Go was absolutely a correct call. It was the way that the market was moving. The problem was it was about five years too early. So as much as I like the PSP Go, I feel like it's gotta be C tier. It just was a little bit too early. The PSP wasn't quite ambitious enough to really take advantage of an all digital edition. Yeah, I'll agree with you. Next up, why don't we make it a little bit old school and go back to the original PlayStation 1. Now I have a lot of fond memories of what was really my first home game console. Now, not only was this a huge leap forward and really sort of popularizing the idea of 3D gaming, but ultimately it was the very first PlayStation. Sony had spent a lot of time working in collaboration with Nintendo, but really the Nintendo PlayStation fell apart and Sony was like, you know what? We're just gonna make our own console. And they did, and it took over the world. It's gotta be S tier, right? Like, I mean, it's, it changed, it like revolutionized so many things. I mean, look, I don't think there's a lot of debate on this one. The original PlayStation was slam dunk, one of the most important consoles of all time, S tier as far as I'm concerned. 100% in agreement. But on the same side of that, the PS1, one of the most forgettable in my opinion. There were some interesting things about the PS1. So when we talk about it, it really was the first real slim console, obviously that Sony had made, but it really sort of solidified the idea 
that you buy the console when it comes out a few years later as sort of technology shrinks, as sort of processes get more advanced and things get more power efficient, that you can make a smaller version of the console and generally speaking, sell it for less. Now the PS1 was very, a, uh, uh, shall we say, conservative approach here and that literally just took the PlayStation 1 design, shrank it down, rounded it off a little bit and pretty much called it a day. But that being said, you take that original PS1 and put it up next to literally any console of all time as far as in the actual home space, it still is pretty impressive. I'm gonna give this one a C tier as well. Okay, C tier it is. Why don't we fast forward a little bit and talk about the PlayStation 3. So the PlayStation 3 was an interesting console in a lot of ways because really if you look back over sort of the last 20, 25 years of consoles, I would say that the PlayStation 3 was the most technically ambitious console of all time. Now, I, I have to to kind of take my take my hat out of this one because I pretty much missed the entire PS3 generation. It's easy to forget how many things the PlayStation 3 sort of brought into the market. It was one of the very first Blu-ray players, right? It really sort of revolutionized in an entirely new format. A lot of people bought PS3s just purely to use as Blu-ray players. And obviously, especially those early models had full support for things like compact flash and memory stick and you had a lot of capabilities to play all kinds of media. So it really was sort of a media center machine. But that being said, that first PlayStation 3 was not a success for Sony. It was so expensive. It really put them behind and it took them years of slim and super slim revisions, which we'll talk about later, to really try to catch up to the Xbox 360. I struggle to place this one because I think you could make a real argument for a very high rank and for a sort of medium of the road rank. Middle of the road rank? I, I would say it, the B is, is like, seems like the fair compromise there. If it was a little bit cheaper, I think I would be A, almost bordering on S, but I think, yeah, I can go for the fat PS3, I can go B tier. So Matt, naturally, we have to move on to the PlayStation 3 Slim. This in my eye is a good example of how Sony for several generations, PS1, PS2, or PS3, did a very good job of taking what was good with the original console and making the much needed improvements to go into the Slim model. So. First and foremost is absolutely the price cut. The slim PlayStation 3 was significantly less expensive than even the discounted versions of the original fat PS3. And it did it with far fewer reliability issues. It ran cooler, it ran a little bit quieter, it was physically smaller. I struggle though again, because it's like, how do we rank a slim versus an original console? Because obviously the original console has all the added benefit built in with the fact that it has all these new features. A slim console always has sort of a, a bit of a higher ceiling on it. I mean. If, if we're given B to the original and then the and then the slim is just nothing but improvements lo logically I would say a if the slim launched at the beginning at that kind of price a easy it would be like much much higher but I think because it still did have pretty major limitations coming from the fat ps3 I feel like it belongs a B tier alongside its fatter older brother all right I'll I'll, I'll take your word for this one I mean lastly we have with the, if we're gonna continue the ps3 we have the ps3 super slim so Matt at this point in the video I usually give some witty remark about blah 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 it's not so bad blah 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 D tier I mean I just hate that it looks like a freaking George Foreman grill I got one of these for my dad for his birthday back when they were new I remember I got it for him and I remember I did a video on it too and then I like opened up the disk drawer I was like Oh, oh, this is terrible. Like, I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs> Next up, around that same time, we had the wonderful PlayStation Vita. So the Vita was an interesting evolution of the original PSP. It was a very similar looking design, and essentially they incorporated a, an OLED display. It was very high resolution, it looked great, and it was a touchscreen. There was a lot going for that first PS Vita. I, in general, like handhelds a lot. You talk about like the touchpads on the back, I hated them. Like I just felt that they weren't super functional. Um, and so like, you know, there's some of the cool features that it had, like being able to do like PS4 Link and stuff like that. But then how many games you couldn't actually play on the Vita because of the, the touchpad being your L2, R2. The problem with the Vita for me 
was that the PSP was really obviously Sony's first real attempt at a handheld console. And as far as I'm concerned, they really knocked it out of the park. Sure, it didn't beat the DS in sales, but it actually did do really quite well. The Vita, I don't think had that same level of success because it really wasn't a major overhaul. They took the PSP, they tweaked the design, they added some new features like a touchscreen and whatnot. They got rid of the UMD drive in favor of Sony memory cards. So like the Vita cards right now, still to this day are like $50 for like a 16 gig, it's absurd. As far as I'm concerned, it's C tier. Yeah, I'm going with you on C tier on this. I like, I think it could have been amazing and it, they just didn't do it. But you know what was amazing? The PS Vita TV. Look man, if we're talking about like weird slim editions and kind of weird upgrades that Sony's done, the PS Vita TV or the PlayStation TV as it was known, was bizarre. So essentially they took the guts of a PS Vita slapped it into a plastic shell, gave it an HDMI port, shipped it, I think, with a DualShock 3, if I remember right, and that was it. You had your PS Vita TV. Now, this was basically capable of playing all the same games that the standard Vita was, except for all the games that required touchscreen support, and, you know, that was not a ton of them, but a lot of them did at least have that as an option. It was great at doing, again, like PS4 Link, so if you're, you know, say your your PlayStation was, you know, in your living room, but you want to play your PS4 games in your bedroom, for a hundred bucks you could get you could get that, stream it to the the Vita TV, and again because you're using an actual DualShock 3 which has the all the fully full bunk, uh, buttons, you're able to play PS4 games just fine. So I remember with the the Vita TV. It was nice to be able to play Vita games and PSP games and PS1 games on your TV. But the thing that always kind of struck me was, while it was cheap, it seemed like they didn't really give any effort at all, right? Essentially, it ran the exact same operating system from the PS Vita, which was very much sort of touch focused. And it didn't really have a lot of optimizations for the TV. Like, it didn't take a lot, at least in my opinion, I don't think it would have taken a lot to sort of make some very minor tweaks to make it a little bit more TV friendly, which would have made it a much sort of better console. You were running PS Vita games that had like huge bubbly interfaces and stuff on your TV. Like, I liked the PlayStation TV. I think it was good for what it was at the time. I don't think it deserves to be very high on this list though. I think when you look at how it compares to all of these other PlayStations, it's a minor footnote in Sony history. I don't think it's something which really merits being alongside the PS2 or the, the PSP or something. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. So then what, C tier? I, I feel like it's D. That's fair, okay. Yep, D tier. I just realized that we've put the Super Slim PS3 and the PS Vita TV in the same tier. I feel like one of these is slightly worse. <laughs> Maybe we should have done F for the Super Slim. That's what I was, I'm saying, man. We're, I, think we, I think we're too nice on these. All right, we're gonna move the Super Slim down to F tier. Executive decision. Of course, we can't be making this list without talking about the absolutely legendary PS2, which right off the bat, I gotta say S tier. I'm gonna have to be a little bit contrary on this one. The PS2 had a lot going for it. Um, just like the PS3, it had sort of the sort of factor that it was really revolutionizing the DVD side of things. So again, this was one of a lot of people's very first DVD player. But the problem with the PS2 was that the first model was big and ugly. What are you talking about? The PS2, the fat PS2 was ugly, right? It was not cool. The slim was cool. I'm sorry. What's it like to be so wrong? The PS2 was a piece of art. All right, it looked modern. Like standing it up vertically looked so good. It was so cool to have a side loading disc like that. The thing with the PS2 is, is that it was a very good console. I'm not arguing that it is supposed to be B tier or C tier or something. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't think the PlayStation 2 deserves S tier. I think it's an A tier. It's a very good console. It was a very important console but it didn't completely change the game the way the first PlayStation did. I do think it deserves A tier, but I don't think it was excellent. I think it was just a decent step up from the PlayStation 1. It had a few new features. It was a little bit more powerful, a lot more powerful, but that was it. I don't think it deserves a huge S tier status. People may disagree with me, but I think A tier is very fair for the PlayStation 2. I, it's For me, it's S tier, man. It's like, yeah. These tier lists, I like, I, you know, you usually can convince me. You cannot convince me on, otherwise on this one. All right, Matt, I will go with you on this. I still think A tier is more applicable. But if you really firmly feel like it's S tier, I will agree. I'm wearing your shirt after all. I can't really disagree with you right now. So Matt, 
We of course have to talk about the PlayStation 2 Slim. Now, I actually really liked the PS2 Slim for the, a lot of the same reasons I liked the original PS1, that it was a very unique way of doing a Slim console. This thing was tiny. It, it looked like a book. It looked like a paperback book. It had a built-in ethernet jack, um, which was a problem for the, uh, the fat PS2, but was later solved. So for me, I think Slim PS2 is C tier. Yeah, I mean like C tier is fine. I just it's just a console that I don't I don't think it added anything other than the price. PS2 Slim, C tier it is. The PlayStation 4 was I think one of Sony's best consoles of all time. With the PS4, they went lean and mean with things, right? When especially when you look at it compared to the Xbox One, which it absolutely destroyed at launch. The PS4 had, sure, some of the basic media features, some of the things that you would expect out of a console, but first and foremost, it was a gaming machine and it did that well. I think it is very hard, I'll just throw my cards on the table right now, it is hard for me to imagine the PS4 not being A tier. So I'll give you the A tier for that, but then I, I, got, a, I got a question, where do we go from here with A tier? Well, let's start with Slim. So with the PS4, going from the original launch PS4 to the Slim, I would say it was actually an incredibly minor change. But realistically, the PS4 Slim was just a cheaper version of the PS4. To, to me, as good as the PS4 was, the PS4 Slim, I'm like C tier, maybe D tier. It just didn't do, like, it didn't do anything for me. It's not, like, it's still the same footprint as the, the regular PS4. It should, like, I think it just should have gone from the PS4 to the PS4 Pro. So what do we talk about the PS4? Pro. This was the very first time in all of Sony's history and really in a lot of sort of the console space dating back to like the Sega 32X or something, where we saw a real mid-cycle refresh. Really the PS4 Pro was a very much 1.5 generation update, which especially when you compare it to a lot of the slim consoles on this list, I don't think it's even close. I, you know, like the, the, you say, you talk about like the price for it. Like, I mean, that might be the biggest deterrent for people is that it's more, more expensive. But like in my case, when I bought the Spider-Man version of it, like you got a copy of the game for free and then also included like the season pass of the game, which pretty much completely offset the cost of going from a, a pro versus like a slim. Yeah, and that's another thing I think that really is a big point in the pro's favor. The PlayStation 4 Pro, pretty much since it came out, has been priced at around $400, whereas the PS4 Slim was at $300. I would say that for another 100 bucks, you're getting a significantly better console on the PS4 Pro, which again makes that PS4 Slim look stupid. I think the PS4 Pro deserves A tier right alongside the original PS4. I think it was a major step forward. I'll agree with you, I like my PS4 Pro. I like it, so I'll give it A tier. No, we gotta talk about PlayStation 5. So, I will say, as we are recording this in a time before the PlayStation 5 is actually out, I don't think we can give this a completely fair rating. But, why don't we give it a try anyway? All right, so I'll take the controversial stance. At the moment, without having seen the console and play, you know playing it, and I'm going B tier. Okay, why do you, so low expectations is the way I read that. There's a lot of things that have come out that disappoint me. So the things that excite me are like the hard drive, you know, how fast that SSD is and the potential that can have. But then on the flip side of that, it's limited to 825, uh, gigabytes and again that's that's pre-operating system so realistically we're probably gonna have what like 950 i mean 750 7 775 of usable storage the things i guess if i were going to start with the negatives the things that are going against it it's very large right i mean you look at the size of a ps5 very very significantly larger than something like even like a fat ps3 you also have a lot of huge question marks as far as where it comes in on price how it compares to series x i think that ultimately could sort of shift things back and forth, especially if it is as expensive or more expensive than what Xbox is gonna sell the Series X at. That's where I say the things I like and things I don't like, because again, I'm someone who likes to go back and replay games. You know, to not be able to play some of my favorite older games on that, that's a negative. We're gonna look at this video two years from now and probably strongly disagree with a lot of the points we bring up. I think a lot of the answers will be much more clear 
In my opinion, where the PlayStation 5 is here today, right now in 2020, pre-launch, I'm going to give it a tentative A tier. I agree. I think it's going to sell really well. I mean, it's just... It it's PlayStation. I will say that I find it super ugly. I don't want that displayed on my on my you know console stand or, or something like that. I hate the I hate the way the controller looks. Like I don't like the two tone. My ranking of a B is again mostly aesthetics. You know I, I look at it and I say I don't like the way it looks. Um, I do fully think that's a very powerful machine and and you know I'm sure it will sell well. But like if if like I just like compared to other consoles, I just don't like the way this thing looks. I think it looks dumb. <laughs> Thank you for watching our PlayStation 5 tier list. What do you think of our rankings? Are we full of crap? Is Phil Spencer foaming at the mouth for how good he's gonna do? Or just, are we completely off base? I don't know, you tell us. If you like the video, like it, subscribe, share it, do all the things that you do on YouTube. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, bye.